Hey, this is Dr. K from the medical school. Today we're going to talk about atrial arrhythmias. So let's take a look at the outline. The outline shows we're going to first talk about how to differentiate atrial versus ventricular rhythms. Then we'll talk about normal sinus rhythm and then get into various topics about the different atrial arrhythmias that you may encounter on an EKG. So let's take a look now at how to differentiate sinus versus ventricular rhythms. When we say sinus rhythm, what we're saying is, does the rhythm originate from the atria of the heart versus does the rhythm originate from the ventricles of the heart? To differentiate between these two, we look at two major characteristics, the P wave and the QRS. If you see a P wave before every QRS, you know that the rhythm is originating from the atria of the heart. Second thing, if you look at the QRS interval, and if the QRS is narrow, that means less than 0.12 seconds, then the rhythm is originating above the ventricles, meaning AV node are higher. If it's wide, as in the rhythm strip below, you will see that the rhythm is actually originating from the ventricles themselves. But we won't discuss about ventricular rhythms in this lesson. So let's talk about normal sinus rhythm. So as always, you should always approach every EKG using the Rahibi acronym, Rate, Rhythm, Axis, Hypertrophy, Infarction, Block, and Intervals. Always, for normal sinus rhythm, to identify it, look at the P waves first. Identify if there's a P wave for every QRS. If there is, then look at the QRS. Is the QRS narrow or wide? Those both criteria will automatically identify that the rhythm is originating in the atria of the heart. So in this case, we have a P wave before each QRS. We have a narrow complex QRS. Thus, we know this is normal sinus rhythm. And as the rate is not elevated, not tachycardic, and not bradycardic or low. So this is normal sinus rhythm. It's a relatively normal EKG. The next rhythm we'll look at is sinus tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia, if you break it down, means one, originating from the atria, and then two, tachycardia, meaning a heart rate that is fast or greater than 100 beats per minute. So first, as we always do, Identify whether this is atria in origin. So are P waves present? If you take a look at this EKG, you see P waves are present before each QRS. In addition, the QRS complexes appear narrow as they are less than 0.12 seconds in width. Thus, you can say this is sinus rhythm. Now that we have noted that this is sinus rhythm, we need to look at whether this is tachycardia normal heart rate or bradycardia. So use your simple formula. Heart rate equals 300 divided by the number of large boxes. So you can say that's about a little less than two boxes between each uh, peak of QRS or each R. So I would probably it was 140 to 145 heart rate. This is normal, this is sinus tachycardia. Next is sinus bradycardia. So we need to identify sinus bradycardia by one, identifying is this sinus or atrial in origin, and two, dividing, identifying if this is a heart rate less than 60. So is there a P before every QRS? Yes, there is a P before every QRS. And two, is there a narrow complex QRS? Yes, there is narrow complex QRS, as a QRS is less than 0.12 seconds in width, or three small boxes. Next, we need to identify is this bradycardia or not. Bradycardia means a heart rate less than 60. So look at the number of large boxes between each, each R wave, and you'll see there are about six boxes between our, each R wave. And thus, you would probably call this a, a heart rate uh, very close to 50. The reason sinus bradycardia is important to identify is that you will be doing different things in different situations when this presents an EKG. If the patient's sleeping, blood pressure's okay, vitals are fine, asymptomatic, Sinus bradycardia may just be an incidental finding. There's really nothing to do. But you always, always need to know about the vitals in sinus bradycardia. On the other hand, if the patient has sinus bradycardia and they've developed hypotension, not to, due to any other cause, you need to intervene for the patient. So whether 
you need to start atropine on the patient until you can get transcutaneous pacing. It's a really important decision to make. Eventually, when you, you need, first thing to know is that transcutaneous pacing is very painful, so you do need to sedate the patient. But once you have transcutaneous pacing, you'll need to go to transvenous pacing. So hopefully there's a cath lab available where a cardiologist can place a transvenous pacer. So skipping ahead, let's take a look at atrial tachycardia. Atrial tachycardia is very important to identify. Like we've identified before, you want to know whether it's a P wave for every QRS and whether it's narrow or wide complex QRS. In this case, in atrial tachycardia, otherwise known as supraventricular tachycardia, it's sometimes difficult to identify these P waves. But what you can identify is the narrow complex QRS, which will tell you that the rhythm is coming from above the ventricles. The reason this is important to identify is that you will have to intervene on someone who's having supraventricular tachycardia. If you see a patient with this in the hospital, the first thing you want to do is get vitals. Always get vitals for any arrhythmia. Two, if they do not break it, break out of the rhythm them, themselves, you need to consider giving them adenosine to hopefully break out of supraventricular tachycardia. You can give adenosine 6 first and then up to 12, but if you're going to a higher dosage, you should always place pads in the patient. And you can actually repeat um, the 6 dosage again to help break them out. One common thing we do is always to rub the neck to induce a vagal response. That way, you can break them out of superventricular tachycardia without giving them any medication. But it's really important to address the situation patient as patients can spontaneously flip into other rhythms when they're in such a high rate of tachycardia. Usually this ranges about 150s to 160s for superventricular tachycardia. Another type of supraventricular tachycardia is AVNRT, otherwise known as AV node reentry tachycardia, where there is an accessory pathway that essentially causes a looping around of the of the depolarization, causing this tachycardia. The one reason to differentiate it is it will look exactly like regular supraventricular tachycardia where you'll have a narrow, narrow complex QRS, you have difficulty finding the P wave. The reason you have difficulty finding the P wave is that it's actually either buried in the QRS or it's just after the QRS complex. And it actually will appear as a negative deflection indicated here right after the QRS complex. This is AV node reentry tachycardia due to an accessory pathway. Another very important cause of sinus tachycardia into the 150s to 160s that the P wave is not readily seen. Now let's talk about atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is a rhythm again that's sinus in origin but there are multiple firings from the atria that are recorded by the EKG. So you get multiple P waves present on the EKG, creating what's called a sawtooth pattern. The sawtooth pattern is very characteristic for atrial flutter, and you'll see multiple P waves before every QRS. The reason this is important is that atrial flutter can lead to either A, destabilization of the patient, or B, can flip into another rhythm called atrial fibrillation, which we'll talk about next. Another thing that's kind of interesting about this EKG in particular is that you see hyperacute or hyperpeaked T waves. These are commonly associated with hyperkalemia. So keep that in mind when you see those peak T waves. But what's really about important about atrial flutter is one, patient can decompensate, or two, can flip into what's called AFib or atrial fibrillation. Now let's talk about atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is again a sinus rhythm where the heart almost quivers and creates what's characteristically known as an irregularly irregular heart rate. So you'll, different, you'll identify this by one, there's P waves before QRSs. Two, the heart rate is just irregular. It doesn't 
stay or doesn't change to one constant heart rate. And again, you can differentiate this from a fit atrial flutter by the lack of sawtooth pattern. But note that patients can constantly fill in and out of atrial flutter to atrial fibrillation. So at times, it can become very confusing. What's really important is to be able to identify atrial fibrillation. Because the patient has a fib, there are certain management decisions you need to make that we'll talk about a little bit later. All right, since we've gone over the atrial arrhythmias, let's take a look at our first example. You can pause here to identify yourself, or we'll go ahead and try to figure out the solution. So one, we see P waves before every QRS, and we see narrow complex QRSs. So already we know this is sinus. Two, if you look at the heart rate using the Rahibi rate rhythm, or rhythm rate, you can see that the rate's pretty fast. It's um, almost about two boxes between each R, thus making about a heart rate of 150. So this looks like sinus tachycardia. What's important to note about sinus tachycardia is the management. So what is the management of sinus tachycardia? It's honestly nothing. If someone has sinus tachycardia, you do not treat just the plain old sinus tachycardia. Now let's look at our second example. In this case, we have P waves again before every QRS. You have narrow complex QRSs. So it's a sinus rhythm above the ventric ventricles. You notice that if you look at and try to calculate a heart rate, that the heart rate is never constant. It's pretty irregular or irregularly irregular. And that term in and of itself should tell you that this is atrial fibrillation. We don't have a sawtooth pattern to indicate atrial flutter. So what is the management of this rhythm? First, for atrial fibrillation, you must know the vitals for the patient. Again, no vitals for all arrhythmias. If the patient's hypotensive and the patient's AFib, the patient needs to be cardioverted because that is what ACLS tells you. Second, let's say the patient's not hypotensive, but just in AFib at a very high rate. The next thing you need to do is you need to bring them down either by rate control or control them by rhythm control. Rate control involves using either metoprolol, a beta blocker, or diltiazem, a calcium channel blocker, either through a drip, pill, or injection forms to bring the heart rate less than 100. Second, patients need to be on anticoagulation if they're in AFib because the heart is essentially quivering. So there's not a lot of blood moving from the atria to the ventricles, and the, and the blood that's stuck in the atria will start clotting off, predisposing the patients to clots, a thrombus that could go to the brain and cause stroke. So based on their CHAD2 score, which you can look up, you have to place, place the patient on aspirin uh, or, or Coumadin. Um, and now we have a new drug called Pradaxa that we can also use to anticoagulate patients with AFib. But these are really two important things to do. In addition, you also can consider things like ablation uh, further along down the road or use of other drugs such as amiodarone, sotalol, antiarrhythmics that can control AFib. So that's our discussion about atrial arrhythmias. If you like this lecture, give it a thumbs up, comment, subscribe, and definitely check me out, out, out on Twitter at iMedSchool. Until right, next time.